If you've watched my review of Disney's new live-action Beauty and the Beast movie, you'll know how much I enjoyed it. But now I want to see how much of a super fan you are of the original animated movie, which by the way was the first animated feature ever to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. yippee ki movie lovers, it's Jan here, and in this video I'm going to be revealing a wealth of fascinating facts about Disney's classic animation Beauty and the Beast. So be my guest and put your Disney knowledge to the test. When it came to creating the book-loving Belle, the filmmakers took their cues from the golden age of Hollywood. For example, Belle's blue and white outfit channels actress Judy Garland's look in The Wizard of Oz, as well as emphasising visually just how different Belle is from the people in her town, as she's the only character who wears blue in the opening sequence. But Belle's costume isn't the only thing that links her to Judy Garland. In fact, one of the reasons that Paige O'Hara was selected to bring Belle to life was that her voice and manner were reminiscent of the quality and warmth of Garland's voice. Other Hollywood icons also left their mark on the character of Belle. For example, screenwriter Linda Wolverton took cues from actress Katherine Hepburn, especially her performance as a spirited and literature-loving Joe March in the 1930s film Little Women. And that was just the beginning of screen legend Hepburn's influence on the animated classic. Indeed, Belle's interaction with the Beast, for instance when she tends his wounds, was partly inspired by the on-screen verbal sparring between Hepburn and Spencer Tracy in the many movies they made together. As we all know from his boastful song, no one does anything quite like Gaston. Yet despite Gaston's insistence on his uniqueness, the filmmakers did actually draw inspiration from a number of places when they created his character. First of all, they channeled the pompous Roman soldier Milas Gloriosus from Stephen Sondheim's musical A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, which was made into a film in 1966, and was a particular favourite of Beauty and the Beast producer Don Hahn and lyricist Howard Ashman. And when she was writing The Big-Headed Gaston, screenwriter Linda Wolverton also had in mind some of her ex-boyfriends. Looks-wise, the animators modelled Gaston after good-looking soap opera stars and added a dash of Superman, as the idea was to make him incredibly handsome and basically the polar opposite of the Beast in both personality and appearance. Speaking of the Beast, animator Glenn Keane, who designed that character, was banned from meeting actor Robbie Benson, who voiced the Beast, until after the movie was finished. Which was very unusual, because on other animated movies, Keane normally spent time with the actors during their recording sessions. However, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was Disney's studio chief at the time, specifically didn't want Keane to be influenced by Benson's looks, personality or mannerisms in how he animated the Beast. As for the design of the Beast, that was based on a variety of animals that Keane observed and sketched at London Zoo in Regent's Park, including wolves, gorillas and mandrills, whose eyes he felt were very human and conveyed real intelligence. Keane also bought a buffalo head from a taxidermist. And in the end, the features of the beast combine a lion's mane, a buffalo's head, a gorilla's brow, human eyes, a cow's ears, a bear's body, and a wolf's tail and legs. When making animated movies, more often than not, actors record their roles separately. But for Beauty and the Beast, Paige O'Hara persuaded Disney's powers that be to let her and Robbie Benson record Belle and Beast's lines together, which they found really helped them get the dynamic right between their characters as it developed over the course of the story. By the way, Benson prepared for his Beauty and the Beast recording sessions by doing the kind of vocal warm-ups he used to get ready when he performed in Broadway shows. It's almost hard to imagine now that we know the movie so well, but several of the film's characters started out with different names. In earlier versions of the story, Mrs. Potts was actually called Mrs. Chamomile. The filmmakers originally named her Chamomile after the soothing herbal tea, but decided to change it when it occurred to them it may be difficult to pronounce, especially for young children. As for Jerry Orbach's character Lumiere, he was initially going to be named Chandal, short for the word chandelier. But again, the filmmakers thought the name would be too tough to say, so instead they went with the name we know today, which was inspired by early cinema pioneers, the Lumiere brothers. Mrs. Potts may sound wonderfully soothing singing about the tale as old as time in the movie's title track. However, what happened to actress Angela Lansbury right before she recorded the song was anything but. Lansbury was on her way to record the tune with the New York Philharmonic when the plane she was on was forced to make an emergency landing in Las Vegas due to a bomb scare. Although producer Don Hahn suggested she rest up overnight in Las Vegas, undeterred Lansbury caught another flight and continued on her journey to New York that same day, going straight into her recording session with the Philharmonic where she nailed the song in just one take, which is exactly what we hear in the film. Originally, Mrs. Potts' son Chip was only supposed to say a single sentence in the whole movie, and that line was, Mama, there's a girl in the castle. The rest of the scenes where Chip appears in the film as it stands today were actually meant to feature a music box which, instead of speaking, made little chiming noises. 
However, the filmmakers decided they wanted to add a child's perspective to the movie in order to make it easier for kids to relate to the story. And because they liked child actor Bradley Michael Pierce's voice as Chip, they kept increasing his dialogue. One of the most enchanting parts of Beauty and the Beast is its songs, so it's incredible to think that composer Alan Menken and lyricist Howard Ashman ever doubted their brilliance for even a second. In fact, they were so uncertain whether the filmmakers would like the opening song they'd written for Belle that they flew from upstate New York, where they'd written the soundtrack, all the way to Los Angeles to play it in person for the filmmaking team. Basically, Menken and Ashman were worried the filmmakers would think they'd gone mad because they covered so many details in the space of just a few minutes in that first song. So, for example, we meet Belle, Gaston, and LeFou, and we find out what kind of people they are, and we learn all about Belle's town and its inhabitants, and how they're so different from her. But Mencken and Ashman shouldn't have worried, as the Beauty and the Beast crew loved the song and the entertaining way it presented so much information and set up many of the film's main characters. And in fact, the song Belle actually ended up being one of a small number of tracks that didn't get changed or rearranged over the course of the movie's development. So, how big a fan are you of Beauty and the Beast, and how many facts did you know? And which is your favourite character and song in the movie? Let me know in the comments below! I've got lots more Beauty and the Beast videos on the way, including some very cool secrets about the making of the new movie, so do subscribe and turn on your notifications for Flicks in the City to make sure you don't miss any of my new videos. And if you enjoyed this, I really appreciate you giving it a thumbs up and sharing it, and why not tap or click here to check out some more videos you might like on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!